Aerospike before this talk, before the invite came in. Oh, wonderful. I didn't know how our marketing is doing that good a job. <laughs> yes. So Ritu is part of our marketing team here. Alright. So, when you heard about Aerospike, What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it another software product? No SQL is first answer. Okay, anything else? In memory. Okay. Key value. All right. Scale. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So I think Ritu is going to have a quiz at the end of talk. So you better listen very carefully. And she has some prizes, I hope. Uh, so I'm just kidding. Don't worry too much. So topic is speed at scale. And what it means is you can have speed in a particular sandbox model at a particular level. And then you want to scale it out. Right? Usually speed and scale are inversely proportional. As you start scaling out horizontally, then your performance kind of starts degrading, right? So I see a few of few of you are kind of more than a decade old here. So you must have seen the Linux use, usually doesn't use, doesn't use to scale for the symmetric multiprocessor, multi-core systems, the memory uh, locks and uh, p-thread locks and so on used to bog it down. So essentially what used to happen is you have one core which is giving you x output, you have five cores, no, five is not a good example, four cores or eight cores, right? You don't get 4x or 8x output, you might be getting 0.6x, right? Because all the other overheads are bogging it down, right? So what Aerospike is doing is it's scaling at the speed, right? scaling linearly without really compromising the speed. Now, if you look at it, it's very, very hard. Linux kind of system took it a good decade to fix it, right? We are less than five year old company. Okay, so if you think about it, that's how complex the problem is and it has been addressed right from the first line of code, the way it was architected, right? That's what makes it very, very interesting. So I can talk about lots of interesting innovations that have, that have been done on the technology stack. Feel free to stop me at any time, right? We'll be happy to take questions. Don't worry about I losing tempo and so on. Anyway, I, I have a habit of blabbering some random things, so it, it can't get worse, okay? So uh, feel free to stop me at any time. We are also going to talk about real-time application of Aerospike. Right? First, we have to understand what is real time. So, who wants to take a stab? What's what's real time use case? Interactive, okay. ATM cash transactions, okay. 
low latency you said something else sorry guaranteed low latency okay eventual consistency okay that could be a trade off for real time it's not really the real time use case okay stock market is real time use case yes state of okay sure yeah so i think we are getting lots of lots of answers right so we are touching the elephant from different sides blind before it right so essentially i want to give you a use case which all of us know right everybody has used ola cap heard of it at least if not right what does happens at the ola cap's back end right all of us are consumers of ola cap right we have our mobile application on our iphone android right we open ola cap application it is tracking our location right it's sending that back to the data center it has a few thousand cars in pune which is also sending its location every second right then it has to do the matchmaking right and it is doing that matchmaking so it's getting two data points consumer and producer and it is applying the business rules saying that i cannot have customer wait for more than 10 minutes so which is the car which can reach this customer it's available the driver is not asleep is still working right what are the business rules they are applying it right that's first use case second use case extending the same example is you book a cab right it has done whatever it had to do and it found a cab where the driver is asked to take this or oh hey yeah uh, or it was kind of uh, uh, opted in to take that okay so if you look at taxi for sure they asked drivers to opt in for certain ride ola cab will say okay you have to take this customer right different business rules you get the driver right then you have to track how far is the driver is it taking a wrong turn then you make phone calls and so on while the driver is 4 minutes away 3 minutes away 2 minutes away 1 minute away right you are tracking it is that information going to be useful after you started the trip okay that's question number 1 second you start tracking that is it too loud okay you start tracking the trip by sharing the your trip right uh the right details with your friend now i can share it with my wife or you can share it with your friends and so on right they can track your ride once you have ride completed right so let's say you are starting from airport reaching home is that information useful to you or your friend or to the ola cab Yes, I'm. I'm talking about after it has finished. No, after you reach successfully, the sharing information is useless. I think that's what the question was. Correct. Right. What that means is, it is going to be useful as not the individual data point for, but for finding trends, doing analytics on it. Right. So. so you require a different kind of system it's no longer a real time system you will get a hadoop or map reduce kind of job to compile all that data analyze that data and make some inferences which are going to be useful to your business so that it runs more efficiently right so real time use case is where somebody said interaction right so it's a real time interactivity and then after a while that data may not be that useful okay or it might lose its relevance from the real time perspective got it okay so this is not a dating service i'm talking about okay uh, yes matchmaking is considered to be a dating service but any service that you're using we talked about ola cab is doing matchmaking between demand and supply okay you use book my show you use uh, clear trip make my trip uh, olx blah 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 right everybody is doing 
uh, matchmaking because the demand and supply is dynamic right it is not the fmcg product where you are uh, producing millions of rain soaps right where you don't have to worry about you running out of supply right you can always do a on demand manufacturing of that right but when olx has only one sofa that needs to be sold out it cannot be sold to two different people right when you are buying a ticket to city pride next door right book my show cannot sell you ticket and sell somebody else the same seat number right you would immediately drop book my show in your mind as a trusted trusted service right so it's all doing real time matchmaking without really failing right and without compromising the user experience is it making sense or it's it's something you already know and i'm just kind of okay so these are few examples of real time use cases first one i'm sure everybody has heard of inmobi right what inmobi does is again it's a match making between demand okay demand is all of us when we are open our mobile phones uh, web browsers or applications and supply is the advertisers which are giving ads to them right there could be multiple other parties in between there are ssps and dsps and so on right everybody is tracked all of us are tracked okay for example uh, i bought kindle for my daughter last week right and amazon is still sending me offers on kindle right so clearly their algorithm is messed up okay but they are tracking me right so all of us are getting tracked you browse for a house you browse for a bike you browse for anything right next day you open facebook and you you are flooded with those kind of ads right that's what the matchmaking is done by inmobi kind of guys right now the beauty is the sls are very very hard right i think i think i'll, I'll skip that for the next slide snapdeal all of us know snapdeal right what is snapdeal doing right i have five iphones for 50% discount right all of us have heard of the big billion day right from flipkart right so think about that kind of situation how you can prevent it how you can prevent bots from hijacking your offers how you can uh, mess up your offer count where you are not giving out 100 offers instead of 5 or you are not giving out any right or you ask somebody to add that into checkout process and then you say oh sorry it's sold out okay if it happens to you think about how you would react right so it's it's very very crucial third example is uh, online fraud detection right so when you're using credit card online right forensic uh, iq is another uh, company which does fraud detection for an online advertising now you think about it online advertising has a sale of 10 milliseconds right somebody is hijacking into that 10 milliseconds and doing a fraud detection before it happens okay what is the sla right and forensic iq does that fraud detection for 500 million users in real time with sla of no more than 2 milliseconds okay so i'm just cranking up the load right to just drive the point home stock trading somebody i think already talked about stock trading so i don't have to talk about it and we already talked about the ola and book my show and so on right so all of these are real time use cases all the names you see are our customers So Aerospike is deployed, and they are using Aerospike for the exact same use case use cases that we have been talking about, right? I just use Inmobi and Snapdeal because it's a lot more relevant from the Indian context. We also have few other customers, but uh, I don't want it to be a marketing presentation. So what's what's the uniqueness of the real time use case? So we are already big in ad tech, so I chose to include one. para on the ad tech specifications so speed of light why it is relevant in this context if your network packet has to travel from east coast of us to west coast of us it takes around 70 milliseconds or more right 
you have SLA of delivering that ad in the customer's browser in less than 100 milliseconds, right? So you knock off 70, 80 milliseconds for the network traffic, right? Or people can go and have six data centers all over US so that they cut down the round trip time, right? You, let's say you bring it down to 30, 40 milliseconds, right? The real time bidding, the auction that starts and finishes in five milliseconds, right? And everybody is tracking a few billion transactions every day, right? So in Mobi, I think they do 150,000 transactions per second, right? And I was, I was just handling one of their issue where they said, oh, by the way, our success rate for getting those transactions in that delta is 99.7%. Okay, where is this 0.3% transactions getting missed? Because that's a loss of revenue. Right? So think about 0.3% of your revenue is getting leaked. Okay, you multiply it by with a billion transactions and it, it could be significant. So that's that's how critical the real time use case is going to be, right? And it's getting almost everywhere now. Uh, online fraud we already talked about. Think about a telco doing real time use case. How does your roaming charges are calculated? It's per second, right? Whether you're using data, voice, SMS, blah, 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 right? And there could be again multiple parties involved. Think about using roaming as a national level, roaming in the international level, right? There are so many delegations that happen when the charges are calculated. And you are you are never going to be happy if charges are not accurate. So I think uh, last part is just a summary of what we have been talking about. These are very high volume transactions very fast moving transactions, very hard SLA and any breach in the SLA means revenue loss. Everybody knows CAP, right? CAP theorem. So these, this is availability and performance, right? Consistency is something that could be compromised. I can give you an example on how consistency could be compromised and by the way, Today's internet generations have innovated a term called as approximate correctedness. All of you have heard of it? Eventual consistency is yes, it's a kind of better name, right? Eventual consistency, yes, you are going to get consistent, right? But approximate correctedness is similar to streaming, right? You lose certain packets, which is acceptable because user may not even notice it, right? Or you might have some jitter, okay? but still okay, okay? If you're charging customer for it, it's not going to be okay, right? So you're sending a tweet, right? Now, what is most important is for you to get that confirmation that, okay, my tweet has been sent, right? Or you're doing Facebook post. If you don't get that confirmation, you are trying to resend that. Again, send it, right? Now, if Twitter or Facebook is behaving slow for that particular second, right? You are just aggravating that problem by asking user to resubmit it, right? So first thing they do is they give you confirmation, yes, it has been sent. When that is delivered to your friends, right? You can't track it and it doesn't matter, right? Your friends may not even see it if they are not online at that time because other news feed will take it away, right? If they are online, are you sitting next to each other? What is the probability, right? So that is the approximate correctedness based on the business requirements. By the way, think about it, right? Uh, yesterday's or day before yesterday's Times of India said Farhan Akhtar has 5 million Twitter followers, right? Narendra Modi, I think has what, 10, 15 million, right? Barack Obama is similar and so on. 
when Barack Obama, Narendra Modi or Farhana are tweeting, it has to be sent to 5 million, 10 million news feeds, right? It's, it's not a small problem to have. So that's where this approximate correctedness is coming into picture. Twitter is still following SLA of 5 seconds so that everybody's tweet is uh, tweet feed is updated. Uh, but that's, that's not a hard SLA for them because they know nobody can track it except them themselves. Okay, can traditional RDBMS work in this situation? I have I have already reasoned it out. So, anybody wants to have any comments? I'm sure somebody knows RDBMS a lot better than I do. So, all right. So let me let me rephrase that. Right? What you said is correct. RDBMS is designed for storing something which is accurate for the perpetual storage. Right? So it could be your bank's transaction which has to be maintained forever. It could be your income tax transaction. Okay, whatever. So it was designed for something which was a prevalent use case 30, 40 years ago. That's where Oracle started. Right? It is something designed for running all the time, right? And it has to be consistent, okay? There could be a delay, okay? For example, the online banking service used to close at 5 p.m. just few years ago in India, right? Now, that is the use case. So, you have the entire night to reconcile the data, right? So, it's, it's very different use case. In an internet world, there is no sleeping time right google doesn't go down facebook doesn't go down because you have users all over the world rdbms does lot more things so that it doesn't lose its consistency okay the acid property that it comes with it comes with schema because you have the primary key second secondary key there are various database triggers what happens how a record should be written right it has to be validated whether it complies with the specific schema that you have defined that slows it down okay obviously you're doing a lot more work plus it does transaction logging so you say begin transaction end transaction commit rollback right so it's not writing it to the master database okay it's waiting for you to say okay my transaction is done please commit okay or i have made an error or user has existed this exited the system so please roll back right so it was written for a very different use case sorry so, essentially, uh, if you look at it, it was for a very different time, very different generation, very different use case. Ten years ago, no company had billion users on their system. Right? Now, we know a few companies who have more than billion users. Right? Most of the companies are tracking cookies ranging from 2 billion to 5 billion to 10 billion right ranging up to 10 billion cookies you would often wonder oh but world's population is 7 billion right how come i have 30 billion cookies right on your laptop let's assume you have only one laptop right how many browsers do you have right so every browser could have a different cookie how many devices do you have laptop tablet mobile phone iot's and so on right so everybody has 10 15 20 cookies right the projection says oh everybody is going to have 10 different ids in terms of uh, the way you have sim cards right because your tablet has one phone has one uh, your running device has one uh, fitbit has one and so on right so that's the volume which which didn't exist earlier and when you want to scale horizontally, you have to have a different DNA of the system, right? All these databases are designed to scale vertically. So, single box will give you very high performance throughput, right? And if you have to do something on the different box, maybe they provide mirroring, okay? But not, not really the data sharding or clustering. It was, few databases, it was added as an afterthought maybe. Can NoSQL fit the bill? So I had 
few guys uh, neo js mongo right can you please comment i don't remember who was working on what but you can right okay go ahead yeah mm -hmm. you're using mongo for in memory okay okay so you're using json yeah basically advertisement in domain complete sir okay so we are actually looking for fast data store as what well. okay we Sure. So I think most of you know about this. So I'll just zip through this. It is designed for individual data records, right? There is no schema. There is no schema validation. Uh, every record is written independently, right? It has no correlation to other databases, other tables, other whatever is the nomenclature for every NoSQL. It is. typically developed for a clustered solution right it's a clustered system which could scale horizontally so one box gives you x right 10 boxes may give you 3x 4x 5x right depending on what what system you are choosing so it could fit the bill okay there are also some disadvantages it's still evolving there is no standardization everybody would say oh my baby is the smartest cutest and so on right so yeah i am with hero spike <laughs> but i i i won't say it i want you to believe let's say by end of this session so that's that's where no sequel is a probable fit but it comes with its own catch and i'm sure all of you have dealt with softwares this, those are still evolving and how how they could be a nightmare because there is no standardization they keep on changing the apis and then something doesn't work so how do you choose no sequel right and maybe that will be helpful to you does it scale linearly right if you are putting 10 boxes are you going to get 10x output if not at least 8x output it should not be 0.8x right you would be surprised that some no no sequel systems really really doesn't scale up when you keep on adding uh, additional nodes in the cluster data balancing how do you balance the data across nodes right let me move to the next point so that it's not confusing so sharding okay so this could be viewed along with sharding right sharding is you are taking your data and dividing it into 10 different partitions because you have 10 different nodes right now it could be done by your application so i say oh this data node one this data node two okay i have round robin okay or i can say mr database please do it for me right what happens if you add 11th node who takes care of your data balancing so 11th node is going to be cold so your application is going to decide oh let's divert all the traffic to 11th node okay that's that's not scalable model what if node 7 dies okay so your application should be focused on your business rules okay because there is already enough challenge uh, to get out of uh, the best you real uh, real time use case and the most efficient business model right so should the application worry about all this intricacies of the database sorry most of the cluster systems use consistent hashing consistent hashing okay uh, so the data balancing happens sharding happens automatically yes okay you might be surprised until 15 days ago or month ago redis which is one of the most popular in memory database didn't have auto sharding right they released 3.0 where they introduced auto sharding okay so i don't know how many of you are redis users here but it's yes 
logically it makes sense okay whether people are really doing it okay is it part of your inherent dna or it is kind of afterthought slapped onto it right sharding is a very popular uh, concept or terminology partitioning yes partitioning goes usually well with sharding right you can have multiple partitions on a single node right sharding is usually uh, used in conjunction with how you are distributing your data across nodes okay but that that goes hand in hand and this is required only when you have clustering how do you add a node to cluster let's say you have production system we we have a few hundred customers and no customer wants to take out their database because it affects their revenue real time traffic so how do you add a node what happens if a node goes down how many transactions can you lose think about you have 50 terabytes of data on one node you shut down that machine and bring it up again how long should it take to boot up sorry around 4 uh, hours around 4 hours is that acceptable no <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it it could take much much longer it depends on uh, how large is the data right most of the databases what they do is they build those indexes on the fly right if you have no indexes on in memory right let's say you are using disk storage you have no indexes in memory your transaction throughput is getting, going to be affected right if you are keeping them in memory you can't have them when the system is died system is died right when the system boots up again you have to rebuild them now how do you rebuild them you have to scan through the data get it up all there right if it takes 4 hours 8 hours 12 hours right that's a potential downtime you are looking at in the production sorry what yes so you can keep all the indexes so that you don't need to rebuild yeah so you can you can do some creative things uh, so for example in case of error spike we already have fast restart where all the indexes are persisted uh, without really adding to the uh, latency or throughput and it could be brought up in couple of minutes for this kind of data volume we are talking about so you don't have to wait for 4 hours 6 hours 8 hours does it work on commodity hardware or do you need special appliances right <coughs> sorry do you do you have to wait for the special appliance when your business is taking up and your appliance guy says oh by the way i can only ship to you this one after a month right so you have to think about that as well can i run it on aws can i just spin up new instances have elasticity defined and be there right i don't have to worry about how many nodes i should have how much traffic i may have right i just define rule with based on cpu memory whatever right and i just keep on spinning new hardware adding capacity okay so we uh, we already talked about how how hard it is to add a node right does it require downtime very very important question we talked about the node down downtime for rebooting it right typically that would be required when you are upgrading your server you already talked about this across data centers and most importantly it should work in your environment if i am working with xyz cloud hosting provider if it doesn't work for me then that database doesn't work for me right doesn't matter if it works for every, everything else right so coming back to the same slide speed or scale okay any questions at this time am i making sense we are just going to get little bit deeper into how aerospike works and we'll try to ponder over the same questions that i have been raising any questions at this time should we talk something else 
is it making sense okay good so since most of you have heard of hero spike i think you already know about it the beauty is it is a database that is written in c written from the first line of code right so there are few databases which are no sql databases written in java okay let's for a moment compare what happens between c and java everybody knows garbage collection right so what happens when garbage collection kicks in yes you can't you can't plan for it that's the first thing right and then it could it could bog down your system performance right without really giving you any flexibility on how to plan for it java is running in virtual environment right jvm c you can directly have hardware interfacing done at the network interface level ssd level hard disk level uh, uh, memory and bunch of things right you can get into the kernel right so you can do all of it it is the first system which was optimized for ssd so 4 5 years ago when the founders of the company were at the drawing board they said ssd is the future let's make it for ssd right let's make it the best performing system for ssd it should work for other environments as well what does that mean you know what is ssd right solid state devices it's everybody has a flash drive in their pocket right usb storage it doesn't have a mechanical rotational component which your typical rotational disk drives have hdds have that means there is no physical component moving to find the data location right so it's going to be faster obviously with your physically rotational disk how many heads can point to different data locations there is a limitation imposed by physics right if your head is at a particular position how how can you read other data at the same time ssd provide you parallel channels right and it depends on the ssd provider 8 16 32 and so on so you have two different two major advantages again it's a sorry yes so i was coming to the next one right again it's a evolving technology right so the cost was higher okay the cost is reducing right and all of us keep on buying this 2 gig 8 gig 16 gig uh, usb drives right so we can see how much we used to pay 2 years ago and now how much we pay right so the prices are falling the problem ssd have is how many times you can read and write from the same memory location there is a variability of ssd so that if you are overusing the same memory location you are going to limit the life of that ssd drive right only for that particular bit okay but you won't know what what bit has failed okay unless you keep track of it how do you overcome that what is what is the optimization can you have number of threads run in conjunction having cpu network card disk io affinity okay so in case of ssd can you have let's say you have eight parallel channels on ssd can you have eight threads with affinity to those ssd channels why yeah but if your ssd has only eight threads uh, eight channels right other threads are potentially going to wait for other threads to finish right so it depends on how how you are using those threads right yeah so you are talking about the handover time right so maybe some other thread can work right so in fact we go to the level where we decide between whether to have a idle wait or a busy wait when we are using a mutex or any of the locking mechanism right if the thread is not going to wait guaranteed to not going to wait more than the time it takes for a context switch of the thread okay why make it context switch no no this is different okay so i'm not talking about the ssd part here okay everybody knows mutex is right okay 
So mutexes can have a busy weight or idle weight. Okay, some systems call it spinning block as well, right? So when you are spinning block, it's like you are doing a while one loop while you are waiting for the uh, lock to be released. Now that is going to be costly, so it's not advised. But when you are making a conscious trade-off, saying that oh this spinning lock is never going to take more than what it takes for the thread to do context switch, it's still going to be faster for me. Right? That's what I was talking about. How do you get over the variable aspect of SSD? Sorry, go ahead. So the qualifying argument was only when you are sure, then only you go for that. Okay. Otherwise, yes, you are fried, right? Yes, you have to be very, very careful. No doubt. So, for SSDs, what we do is, first, we don't read and write as much as possible. So, we write in terms of blocks, right? Read you have to do anyways. You can't get away from that. Second, we use SSD with no file system as a block store. And you use it as a ring buffer. So, you write at the first location, Next, 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 you go on writing until the end of the SSD drive, right? And then come back to the first location. That means you are going to use that first location, not the maximum, right? But it's an equal distribution. Okay, move on. Yeah, so uh, we are ACID compliant at the record level, not at the transaction level. There is no concept of transactions. Which is, I think, uh, most true for most of the NoSQL databases. The ACID compliance level may be different, slightly better, slightly lesser. We have deployed with hundreds of customers for more than three, three and a half years with zero downtime. Sure. So you understand what is ACID, right? Okay. So you have to maintain. You have to promise, right? what I'm writing, okay, when I'm reading, I should get the latest copy, right? And I have to get a consistent copy of the data. Let's say I have a replication factor of two or more. That means when I'm writing X equals to Y, we are a key value store, right? When I query for X, I should always get Y, right? When I say, by the way, I'm updating this record, X is equal to Z, right? And I'm querying. What is that I should get? Should I get Y or Z? Correct. Okay. Okay, so Y was first and Z is later, right? So you will get Y unless that commit is happening, right? Here, there is no concept of commit because there is no transaction, right? So once the client application says X is equal to Z, right? Whenever there is a next read, no matter where it's reading from, it's a distributed system, you have multiple copies of the data, right? It should always get Z back. Okay, that is what the record level acid compliance would be. So, see, think about it, right? You are writing as x equal to y, right? The data is written in the database, the transaction has completed. You are writing x equal to z, okay, which is a new value for x. Something goes wrong with the cluster, okay? Your node, which is holding this copy, has died, right? Your z might be in flight, right? It might be written only on one node, not written on the second node because the second node doesn't exist anymore, okay? Let's say nothing happens to the cluster. You are write, writing it to the master record, master copy of that particular record. We don't have master node and uh, slave node or replica node. Master copy of that record, right? And you are going to write it to the replica, right? 
now you you have some potential inconsistency right so by default we are consistent right okay synchronous right that's a blocking yes yes Okay, so can, can we just park this question? Okay, I'm, I'm going to cover this in uh, the right code path, right? So I'll just write it down here. Okay, so that we don't forget it. Okay. By the way, with that synchronous write, what we are claiming is performance. Okay, that is with synchronous. You can turn it off and you will get even higher. And that's why this is true. Okay. So you can turn it off. Your application can survive with that. Completely up to you. Okay, simple configuration change. Auto clustering. How how the clustering happens? So we are talking about how Aerospike works now, right? So forget about all the other databases that we were talking about. Step one, bring up all the nodes. Step two, there is no step two. Right? That's that's how simple it is. Now you think about it. Every node is a different piece of hardware connected over network. They have to detect each other. They have to know each other's existence, right? They have to have certain handshake between them for sharding, partition maps, and blah, 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 right? That they have to do with almost no talking to each other. So the clustering, the auto clustering starts and finishes in less than 10, 100 milliseconds. No, it's not required. Sure, but we'll, we'll come to that. I'll just park here. So, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll not answer that question. I will ask you another question so that it becomes clearer. You're talking about a real-time use case, right? And you're talking about your cluster to work at the fastest possible speed. Does that allow you to have your nodes not connected in the same physical LAN network, right? If you are not doing that, you are not doing justice to the real-time use case, right? So that's that's how it would be. That's that's not one cluster, though. That's not one cluster, right? What is what is multi-master? Sorry. Um, let's say if I have two data centers, correct? So. Uh, I mean, if if I am talking, I mean, I can have any kind of routing mechanism to mm -hmm. go to one data center always. Okay. And if one data center goes down, mm -hmm. eventually, you know, my routing will take care to go to the another data center. Okay. Maybe. So, I mean, we did uh, for the Oracle at a storage level that, you know, eventually making consistency yeah. Yeah. at... Uh, two data centers but okay. so let me let me jump through a few things uh, so i'm just not going to follow the slides because i think the questions are very interesting is this visible or do we need lights here is this visible okay so you have a data center right and you throw N1, 
n2 n3 as nodes you have another data center you have n10 n11 and 12 right we are talking about having a cluster of this and this right how these clusters talk to each other okay let's park that we'll cover that as we move ahead how these nodes discover each other right there are two ways this is possible and i can i can also walk you through the configuration setting and we can do the cluster forming that's that's something i have planned depending on how much time we are left with so if your network allows you to have a multicast everybody knows multicast okay so if your network is enabled for multicast these nodes discover each other okay now discovering the node is not sufficient so n1 says oh i found n2 right n3 says by the way i found n1 and n2 and they have the gossip protocol and they say okay fine looks like we have n1 and n2 n3 right and the algorithm stops at the 100 millisecond uh, time window and they say okay so we are a family of three nodes let's work amongst these uh, three node family that's the starting step you have other things to do right if i write x equals to y which node should get that data right and all these nodes after this they don't talk to each other except the hard bit and sending the replicas right they don't ask each other oh should i take this or should you want do you want to take this it it also never happens that node 1 says okay i will have this node 2 says i will also have this how does that happen you want to get into the details okay sure so you understood how multicast uh, could happen second is unicast or mesh right so you you specify a seed node right and they start discovering each other okay this this is useful when multicast is not available on your network typically seen in the cloud providers because they have too many instances right so they don't want too much of chatter in their network so they turn off multicast so you form the cluster what it does is somebody asked about the partitioning right i think the gentleman in the back right so every node or every cluster okay let me roll back i think we are we are really jumping ahead of the slide so some some are going to be buzzwords for you so we call database as namespace in our terminology okay so you just remember namespace as database right when you create do a create database in mysql right it's similar to you are defining a new namespace in aerospike okay so per namespace we have i'll just erase this and use it four k partitions okay which is 4096 okay every node gets a node id what is the node id node id is hash or hex of a mac address and port right why these these two are needed if you are running it on physically different machine is guaranteed to have different mac address if you are running multiple nodes in your typical test environment on the same hardware you would have different port right this could give you some weird combination based on which virtual machine virtual images you are using okay so every virtual image has kind of different uh, notion of uh, handling mac address and port and so on so you get node id right and you do this uh, let's say in some form of algorithm right so let's say a simplistic is alphanumeric right so you just sort it on alphanumeric level and you go on assigning these four 4k partitions to all these nodes 
right? So uh, divided by three may not be appropriate, but let's say we have four nodes, right? So every node has one K partitions. Clear so far? Okay. Let's say you have defined replication factor as two. So you also get replicas of one K each. So let's say green are replicas and black are the master copies. So far with me? All right. There is no correlation that this master has this replica or this master has this replica. Okay. It is some algorithm. Every node has the same algorithm. They calculate which partition should go where. Right. Who should be master for that replica, uh, that partition? Who should be master for that replica? Okay. So remember, this is not a node that is master and this is not a node that is replica. This node is going to be master for 1k partitions and replica for 1k partitions. This node 1k master 1k replicas. So there is no central authority which says thou shall. Right? Okay. That, just, just hold on. Right? We are, we are getting there. So it's a democratic system. There is no central authority. That's where the linear scalability with horizontal scaling has been made possible, right? There is, this node doesn't depend on this node to say, should I accept this record? Should I return this record? Once you go through this, this is the partition map. This is created upfront. This is recreated whenever the cluster state changes. Right? Do you see? Do you understand what is cluster state change? Right? Cluster state change is going to be you add n five, or you lose one of the node here. Right? So the cluster change right now. Let's say you are writing key. Hard to read. So key x equals to value y now the cluster okay before we do that right let me also talk about one more thing so how do you connect to these nodes this cluster right so your application which could have multiple copies right use aerospike library aerospike library so we provide uh, jars, SOs, DLLs and so on, right? Now this client provides you not the JSON interface but a simple get put kind of interface. So you don't have to use the HTTP REST JSON kind of mechanism but we use a binary protocol between client and nodes. You can specify this client has to connect to node 1 or node 2 or node 3 right it just requires one node to be connected to it discovers the other nodes it discovers the partition map the client also has the same algorithm for finding partitions so when you get key equals to x client is already connected to all the nodes it knows the cluster state and it knows which node is going to accept this value same way on the way out when you're reading it back right client knows which node has this value x yes yeah so I'm, we are open source company right so there is nothing to hide right you can as well go and download the source code so there is no rocket science right but it's just the beautiful application of a simple logical thing right so you get key equals x equals to y, right? We store this using uh, ripe 160 md hash, which provides a 20 byte 160 bit hash, right? It is guaranteed to be unique and 
it is guaranteed to be providing the same output for the key that you specify. Okay, it's again a third party algorithm. We have just tested multiple of uh, these hashing algorithms and this is the one which is found the most reliable one. The hash is going to be normal distribution, right? So we take, we have 4K partitions. We take, so we get this 160 bits hash value, right? We take some 12 bits of this, which are also guaranteed to be random, okay? Hence, no, normal distribution. So, for every key, these 12 bits define which partition ID. So, this 4K, right, or 12 bits essentially tells you which partition ID it should go to. Okay, so there is no rocket science. You are just doing a small hex operation, right? And then when this record is getting written, what you are doing is you are padding it up with some additional data, okay? Additional data is uh, what is the generation, right? So that you can do some resolution, uh, which one is latest record. You, you can have expiry or TTL in our terminology, time to live. We talked about the data may not be all that relevant after a while, right? So you can say, oh, this data I don't care after an hour or after five seconds or after infinite time, right? You can set it up. And then this 64 bit, 64 bytes, sorry, is the primary index. Right? So every namespace maintains partition trees. Okay. So for every partition it owns, so let's say a namespace, it has partition IDs. Right? Every partition ID has a B tree. Okay, which is nothing but this 64 byte hash. So, why Aerospike is so fast is because let's say you have 2 billion records on one node, right? On one partition. How deep the tree is going to be? 2 raised to 20, 21. Sorry, 21, right? So, how many lookups are you doing? So, you have 2 billion into 4K. These are number of records, not the data size. So, for 2 billion keys on one partition map, one partition ID, you are doing namespace, partition ID, and then potentially 21 levels deep okay so in 23 simple lookup operations you are finding 2 billion into 4k which is what 8 uh, trillion records on on a cluster right and on the network side client already knows which node this record is on client already knows even in the partition uh, rehashing right when the nodes cluster state changes it knows where the data is moving to. Okay, we allow reads and writes even when the data is in transit. Okay, so you lose this node. I think I have, I have taken some efforts to do it in a graphical mode, so let me use that. So we talked about auto sharding. I could have done it better coming from the top. But you can see I'm an engineer, not not an artist. Okay, so this is randomly distributed. Okay, client application doesn't care about it. Okay, the client library knows exactly this is where it has to be stored, and for reading as well, this is where it's going to be read from. So same thing, but how how the rebalancing happens? So let's say we lose one of the nodes. 
this data is distributed according to the new partition map right so the process that we went through when the cluster was formed okay the same process is repeated so you get new new state of cluster in 100 milliseconds the flight mode starts for the data right data which is in flight is also tracked okay so you can do reads and writes obviously the data that is moving between two nodes is also going to consume your reads and writes cycles so your throughput is going to be lower right so if let's say getting 10000 reads per second right or 10000 reads and writes when the migrations are happening let's say there are 5000 migrations happening per second so your actual read and write write throughput is going to drop to 5k because 5k is consumed by somebody else but it's never blocked hello uh, could you please tell us one scenario where we are reading or writing data while in transition means uh, how we are uh, the scenario where we will be writing data read and writing data uh, while the data are in migration and so okay. we hardly sure to... sure absolutely so I'm, i'm very happy so if you look at a few slides down i have written a question should we go deeper into the technical aspect so i think jumping into that right away should we take a break yeah. i think it's past an hour right yeah okay so we'll take that up after we come back yeah let's take a break now and if anybody who have not signed the sign up sheet please i request you to come on the table and write your name and email id thank you so we take a break of like huh, 10 minutes samir okay 10 minutes awesome Yeah, so five ten we meet here again. But thing is, this record from cluster one to cluster two, there is no correlation. Cluster two, cluster one might be in memory. Cluster two might be HDD. Cluster one might be SSD. Cluster two might be memory. Whatever is the correlation, right? You could have two nodes in one cluster. You could have ten nodes in another cluster. you could have you would definitely have a different partition maps so the record is going to be on node a in cluster 1 it could be on uh, node c in cluster 2 so there is there is no guarantee that that partition map or that record kind of affinity for the nodes is going to be managed it's it's completely different world when that record gets shipped right it is going to be treated as a new write for the receiving cluster okay and the same logic that we talked about will be used you could have different topologies if you have let's say the new york uh, dc shipping to all these four or five right the drawback is it is going to consume into your write throughput because it's writing four times you is you're getting one write and it's amplifying it to the four writes for every record okay so your throughput for that particular node or that cluster is going to be down by 80% right so you want to do that in a more cautious way what happens if you have ring right you get all of us have seen the circular dependency error in excel right so what happens if i make SFO connect back to New York, or is Japan connects back to New York? So these writes are treated as normal writes, but it comes with a flag saying that this is coming out of client, this is coming out of. So this cross cross data center replication is called XDR in aerospace terminology. So it's coming out of XDR. So it has that special value where it says, by the way. is this something that i want to write or i want to throw it off or i want to propagate it okay so it's part of the configuration setting there are still going to be corner cases right it's still evolving but uh, xdr is one of the most complex cases this is part of the 
enterprise edition by the way so community edition doesn't have this feature <coughs> share nothing architecture so we we already spent a uh, great deal of time here let me just make sure i have not missed anything so we talked about no master node no slave node there is no central authority every node makes independent decisions and arrive at the same conclusion which is most important so that you don't have the conflicting situ situation okay so that is that is the part how you, how do you connect to the cluster right okay so let's let's talk about that okay that's that's on this slide okay why don't i do this right i'll just write down all the questions okay let's zip through the slides and then we'll to the whiteboarding as long as it takes so we talked about right acid uh, what was the question again client. how client connects to okay okay all right so i think we have talked about most of these things yeah one most important thing is it assumes all nodes are identical right if you're in democratic society you cannot have the caste system right everybody is going to be treated equal so if one node has higher throughput other node has higher storage right they are going to be treated equal so you are not going to be making use of the higher throughput that is coming out of one node so you are wasting that power right so just just be cognizant of that storage mode sure yeah okay can you elaborate the question i understand hotspot is something where most of i understand as a hotspot is something where a given node is being loaded Correct. more as compared to others mm -hmm. uh, now uh, as it's a it's a peer to peer architecture where uh, data is kind of distributed across the cluster uh, and there is a partitioning mechanism which basically takes care of uh, how the Uh, partitioning will happen and i believe that uh, a part partitioning is also a function of how you choose a partition key okay right uh, that's 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 driven from the application no uh, that is part of the algorithm that comes pre packaged the application doesn't know application doesn't care application cannot say this data exists on this node okay that is part of the client library that aerospike provides right but then uh, again it will be just doing a hashing based on let's say that i have uh, I, i will talk in case of cassandra where we have the token range mm -hmm. right and then uh, uh, each node is uh, assigned with a particular token range and whether whether my data will be stored in a particular token range sure. is dependent on what is the partition key i'm selecting sure. right yeah so if i am not uh, selecting uh, the right partition key it will it will uh, eventually uh, no uh, get into hotspot kind so, of a, so when you when you say i am not selecting right who are you as the a model as, as a data modeler uh, are you an application yeah on an application okay yes. all right got it fine so what i mean by having no hotspot is crude uh, transformation but not having any single blocking thing or single point of failure right everything is kind of distributed right so you have parallel paths for almost every operation now that means something is not working something went south something went down right your operations are not blocked that still continues okay that's what i mean okay so we will we'll talk about that as well i think when we talk about the migration part we'll we'll talk about the hotspots as well i think you are ready to lose the second ipl match as well that's great sorry oh is it okay i, I haven't been paying attention to okay <laughs> all right 
So uh, we have uh, a few storage models. One is in memory. I think all of you understand that. Second is disk storage, right? Which is pretty common. Uh, so you can choose SSD or HDD. Uh, SSD we already talked about. By the way, I missed uh, talking about that. I was talking to one of you uh, and I mentioned that ACT, Aerospike Compliance Test, is something defined and developed to test SSD performance. And that is used by most of the SSD providers in the world today. So Intel did a blog last month saying that they are the only SSD provider who does 1 million transactions per second on single SSD using Aerospike certification test. So that's, that's how uh, reliable or uh, so essentially people are people are using us in a lot more relevant manner Google Cloud has been doing some work uh, to show throughput of Google Compute Engine so uh, there was there was a block published on Google platform page a couple of months ago which which by the way shows uh, what Cassandra takes 300 nodes to do Aerospec does it with 50 nodes coming out of Google third one is uh, okay so disk storage primary and secondary indexes are still in the RAM right uh, we talked about the fast restart that's where these indexes, not the secondary index yet, but the primary index gets saved onto the persistent store, right? So when you boot it up, it doesn't have to build from the scratch. It can just load it up. Hybrid storage is something where you can uh, use Aerospike in memory database configuration, right? But it maintains the persistence copy. So even if your node goes down, comes back up, right? It has that data. It doesn't lose that data. So you have advantage of uh, in-memory system, but also have the persistence without really having the transient nature of the DRAM. I think we, we talked about a bunch of these. So we have mastered shared nothing architecture. I know a bunch of other database companies who have been trying to do these kind of systems, uh, but they haven't really gone past solving multiple hotspot issues, right? Uh, if you have a central authority who decides who gets what record, who does how partitioning works and so on, right? It doesn't scale because as your number of nodes keep climbing up, uh, it, it starts uh, failing, starts slowing down. SSD we already talked about, uh, cluster formation we already talked about, optimized for, yeah. So rack aware is something, uh, another unique thing I would say. So you can have a replication of two, three, whatever is the number, but there could be a situation and this happens with the physical racks that you may have in your data center where a rack could go down. So you can configure it saying that my master and replica of that no, uh, record should never be on the same rack. Okay, so the partition map alignment is customized so that you always have the other copy on different track. So you get higher confidence assurity of the availability okay so I think we have already started talking about this namespaces we already talked about this sets is kind of tables what we would see in the RDBMS records is same as a record thankfully and it's a key value store so you can have you will have one key per record and that has to be unique across the namespace and then you can have multiple bins bins is nothing but a value okay so instead of having a key value pair right you have key and then a list of bins so you can you can do your data modeling based on that and the data types are supported are uh, strings integers bytes blobs list and maps metadata we already talked about it we say generation count so that we can do the resolution in case of uh, issue 
for example if your node goes down right you don't have faster restart right again the, there are only two enterprise features one is uh, faster restart and second is xdr the cross data center replication let's say you don't have fast restart feature in your deployment what it's going to do is it's going to scan the entire disk entire database and it's going to build that primary and secondary index okay that's where it takes whatever four six eight hours right depending on yes yeah so that 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 is required when you're doing a cold start for example right when your node comes up you you still have data right now you have to determine what data do i have correct how do you determine that you don't have any index because that is lost right if you have to build that index you have to scan that right so node coming up will take its own sweet time based on how large your data is and then after that with the new partition hashing it will know that okay i have to be master of this partition i have to be replica of this partition but i already have this data okay but by the way what is the generation count i don't know so i have to get it okay if i'm the node which never went down okay but i'm with the new scheme of things because new node came in or other node died i'm getting a new master replica relationship okay i will again see what is that i already have okay so that i don't have to do extra copies right so let's say i was master of replica 9 and now i'm replica of 9 okay so i say okay i'm all set don't do anything right or it could be that i was master of 9 and i am still master of 9 right i say okay don't touch me so you just optimize that right but when the node is coming up right it has no option but to scan it right and then you can as well do a clean start because you haven't lost any data because you already had a replication right you can say okay i just want to wipe off this uh, disk so you can just do dd command right do entire clean start right it is treated as a brand new node it boots up the node faster okay it has to copy more data yeah it's a trade off so bunch of clients are provided uh so you can choose what is most appealing to you this is also available on the website so i would i would not spend too much time okay this is something let me try it okay what i was thinking is i will just bring up nodes and try to see if we can do the live cluster and things like that will that will that be a good test of what we have been talking about okay so i have three virtual machines so again remember that this is three virtual machines running on this small laptop so don't expect too high throughput all right so where am i all right I'm using Vagrant. All right. So while the other Vagrants are still booting up, what I can do is I can run one node, right, and then we'll keep on adding the nodes. and we also have a ycsb test suite which is a yahoo cloud benchmark suite uh, so we will run that suite on this cluster 
and I think that will also answer the cluster connect problem, right? So let me start node one. By the way, how do you install Aerospike? Okay, you download RPM, you do RPM install of that package, or in fact, there is a command line AS install. Okay, you run AS install, you do service Aerospike start. There you go, you're up and running. Okay, so it should not take more than two minutes unless you're on pathetically slow network. <laughs> so, whatever time it takes to download, right? Do you want to look at the configuration parameter first? How do you configure? Okay. You can see this, right? It's it's only one service called ASD. Sorry? It's only one process which is running as a demo. That's it. Every node is running the same process. All right, so I can make it bigger. Is this better? All right. So, service level, you define how many service threads you want, how many queues, and how many threads per transaction. How, how many threads per queue? Okay, so service threads is number of threads which are kind of listening on the incoming uh, connections from the client, client application. We recommend this has to be in line with number of cores that your machine has, right? Transaction queue, three, four usually works for most of the cases. Transaction threads per queue, again, three, four usually works, right? FD proto max is number of simultaneous connections like the U limit, right? How many FDs you can have per box. So this is per box, not per cluster. Address, you can specify the local address, uh, private address, public address. This address, the service address, right? is something that is used for the client communication, right? Interface address is something that is used for the internode communication, right? If you specify a public IP address here, potentially you're going to have slower connectivity. It's, it's going to go through multiple resolutions and so on. I'm going to run it as multicast, okay? Uh, you can also configure it as mesh by specifying one or more seed nodes. I have defined one namespace test, right? Replication factor is two. It's storage engine as memory. TTL is one hour. So after one hour, I don't want that data to exist. And this is from last re recently updated last updated timestamp, right? And memory size is 1 GB. Okay, so I'm going to run three nodes. So every node is going to take 1 GB as storage and then some process, right? So I, I, I want to make sure that the laptop doesn't go out of uh, memory. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it. Okay, you can you can specify the right block size and we'll, we'll get into the details. So this is the block size. We, we mentioned that it's going to be written writing the data onto the disk in blocks, right? So what block size it should be using? So the values allowed are 128K to one megabytes in multiples of 128K. Okay, so essentially you have four combinations, okay? There is no performance implication, right? It's just matter of configuring it, saying that how big my record could be. Your record size cannot be bigger than what you configured here. So maximum record size you can have is one megabyte. If you know your record size are going to be smaller, you could poss possibly do a smaller record block size. So you can't put a record size, you're writing code. So you have a key and the business that we have to disturb the code value. Correct. So if you say a record, yeah. are you referring to the entire entity or are you talking about the code? Entire entity. Is it the uh, two people? 
can be is considered to be less okay now if you put that in the perspective of real time use case think about how much the throughput you get over the network interface right if you are reading more than 1 megabyte and you still expect 1 millisecond as your sla right you have to compromise somewhere so our sweet spot is the real time use case can we make it work with 8 mb or 64 mb yes okay how much extra overhead it would have okay we'll have to open up additional bits in our binary protocol okay and is going to take small hit in terms of network size it's going to use okay that's that's the cost no community edition doesn't have any restriction in terms of throughput performance features except the two i mentioned except the two features i mentioned the fast restart and xdr the cross it cross data center replication we also have a startup special where you get uh, for startups you get enterprise edition for free for one year and obviously enterprise edition has support right community edition will go to the forum and then it will also be answered but uh, it 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 won't have the slas that we would have for the enterprise edition it's it's a red hat model nothing nothing new fair enough all right let sorry say that again i think this uh, display is not fitting with my resolution okay so let me okay so i see one node is already up right we have started only one node right remember that okay let me start the performance test okay so i'm going to start a performance benchmark test where i'm connecting to port 151 port 3000 this is namespace test i'm going to insert 30000 keys uh i forgot what this parameter is for but we can look up on the documentation this is going to have string string type with 100 bytes with read and write as 50% balanced and client threads 15 Okay, so 15 client threads are going to pump in the data, right? It is going to use the first node as seed node, right? And right now there is no concept of second node because we are only running one node, right? We will see how automatically the load gets distributed, right? And how the balancing happens, rebalancing happens, partition maps are recreated, and so on. All right. So I hope it doesn't crash. Okay, so it's writing. Now it's first going to populate all the keys, right? Thirty thousand keys, and then it will start updating those keys. So write is also update, right? So first it's just the insertion, and then it will start up, uh, updating those records. So it's doing equal number of reads and writes. Okay, so you would see it's kind of matching, right? Four point five k, four point seven k reads and writes. Now go to, sorry. This is YCSB uh, ported for Aerospike. Okay, so it's a command line tool that is deployed along with every client that you download. Okay, and you can run it so that you can test in your environment what is the throughput you can get. And there are there are a bunch of parameters, so I can as well show you this. Right. So this is Java benchmark that I'm using. Sorry, I'm not hundred percent sure. How do I minimize the font? Can somebody help me with that? Is it Command minus or no? It will maximize it. It won't do anything. Okay, fine. 
So this is the page for how to run benchmark test and bunch of options. So let's go to yeah yeah do you have some comparison of this database with other competitors and when you say fastest is it like 1.1 fa times faster than the next guy or is it like two times faster? What what's the yeah. scale you are talking so, about? Yeah, I, I made a comment right earlier that uh, everybody says their baby is the best and cutest and most lovable and whatever, right? So if we say we are zillion times faster than others, right? Nobody is going to believe it, right? So we ask our partners to publish those reports, right? So there are a few tests and uh, that's that's in the public domain. Uh, what says okay so a third party company does benchmarking test for cassandra mango couch and so on okay in their own environment their own kind of set of things right they might be running ycsb or some other benchmarks and then they publish the results right so instead of i saying that okay we are so much faster because the answer also depends on what kind of workload it is right some databases are optimized for read some databases are optimized for write. Okay, think about what happens to Cassandra. You are a Cassandra user, right? When you are having generation count as 100, you have updated record 100 times, right? And then you are trying to read it. Okay, it's very different architecture Cassandra has, okay? Where one record might be split into 100 different locations. So it has to go assemble it and then send it back. What is going to be quicker? Getting it from one place, or get, gathering it from 100 different places, right? But it is optimized for the write, not for read, okay? Mongo is other way around. So if you, if you look at it, that's where we are the fastest with qualification for the balanced workload, right? Why we are faster? We are also writing it in C, right? We are optimizing it for SSD and all those things, right? So you, you cannot get a clear cut answer saying that, yes, it is fastest in all the cases, right? Even for the case that you are faster, you, you know, you balance workload. Yeah. Even for that case, you would have benchmarks of other database for the same use case, right? Yeah. You know, 50% read, 50% write, so you mm -hmm. know. So, so, so I'm I'm trying to see. Well, when you say fastest, is it like 1.1 times faster? Oh, okay, <laughs> I see. So, okay. You know, on the same benchmark. Yeah. So I would I would say uh, I think that's also answer to your question, right? So in memory, uh, we see Redis is the closest competitor, right? Uh, for the persistent store, there are Mongo, Cassandra, Couch, uh, a plethora of other players, right? So, in memory case, I think we are comparable to Redis in terms of throughput. But we are also doing clustering, adding consistent writes across multiple copies and so on. Okay. With Redis, you may not get the consistent replication. Okay. You can turn it off and then you could say, okay, I'm as good as Redis, sorry, if not better. For the persistent store, Maybe we are 5x, 10x faster than most of the other competitors, right? That's that's the scale we are talking about. All right, so we have first node. So. Okay, so let's look at how we are doing in terms of throughput okay so this is this is usually very different so right now this 
display is kind of shrinking that so it looks very different so i have to also struggle through oh it has already started the third node as well okay so nodes are configured to start with vagrant okay so i can i can bring it down and then we'll see but anyway let's look at it right so we didn't plan so it, it has already jumped right so we have all the three nodes in the cluster we don't do anything special except booting up the vagrant okay if it's not auto run okay all you do is service hero spike start that's all you did we configured the test for 30,000 keys if you remember right this is kind of approximate equal distribution okay if you sum it up i think it's going to be 60k because it's the replication factor of two fine so far we are seeing a traffic of 4200 writes uh, sorry reads and 4300 writes okay the number of keys are going to be same because we said 30,000 keys have to be created, 30,000 records have to be created and just keep on updating them, okay? You can set it for 100,000, 1 million, whatever the size. I'm not really stretching this tiny laptop with three virtual machines. So far, you're with me? All right. Now, let's see what happens if I bring down one of the nodes. Not this one. So, which one should I bring down? Second, first, third. Let's bring down the first node because our test connected to the first node, right? So in case there is a doubt. So let me just say stop. Node went down. Migrations have started. Okay, we should see approximately 30K, 30K keys. And by the way, this is interesting, right? So you see the dip. Okay, this is this is an error, uh, so we should fix it. So the dip is where the node went down, where it had to do the rehashing of the partition map. So it had a brief moment where the throughput dropped. Now the throughput is lower than what it was. It was earlier 4.2k. Now it is what 3 3.7k, right? because the migrations are still treated as writes. Oops. Come on. I think the problem is with this URL. Which, which node did we lose? So, I see, AMC, the management console is running on only one node, okay, and that is the node we have brought down, okay, so it's only AMC which cannot connect, okay, the cluster is still running, we can re-verify that by bringing it up and we'll pull down some other node. No, you can, you can have AMC running on all the nodes, right? On my Vagrant image, I have installed AMC only on one virtual image. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can run it on all the VMs, okay? Do you want to do that? Because anyway, it's reporting your cluster-wide status. Replica is not on the same machine because this is a virtual image. Okay, so it's treated as different Linux box. Okay, so you would never have master and replica on the same box. Otherwise, why why should you have replica? Okay, so master of the partition, whatever. So let's say partition ID uh, three. I'm master and 
this node has died right i have a replica for this partition id that take over okay and so your migration will fix it anyways right but if i don't respond i know the replica exists on the other node okay and i will read from there no 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 so as you see we we brought down nodes we brought it up right so what happened the reads and writes were never interrupted right now you can also do this in the command line mode uh, so let's say i do okay not the right way of doing it it's connecting to 127 so i have to specify the vm address I think my machine is kind of slow right now. Should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's gonna be slow. Okay, so why don't I stop this test, right? So that I can free up certain system resources. You would see the reads and writes rate dropping now. Yeah, there you go. And let's bring down the other node. So we chose the first node last time, right? Let's choose the second node. Second node is I think 152, right? So these are migrations for the partitions, right? Whichever partitions existed on this, which were occupied, those are partitions going on. So that was the proof of the pudding. Okay, so again, it's reporting that error. I think I, I'm going to report it back because this URL is still including all the three IP addresses for the nodes. Okay, so it's reporting that it can't connect to a particular thing. I'm sure it's still updating. All right, so let's move back to the PowerPoint. Why don't I stop everything so that the machine will be a little faster. I think it's a uh, loaded question, right? Price is con uh, consisting of multiple parameters, right? One is what is the software price, right? You could be using community edition, so that is zero, right? Second is what is my infrastructure cost, right? So if I have to run a terabyte of data uh, with 
50,000, 100,000 transactions per second. Think about how many nodes do you need, right? And that is your cost you are paying to AWS or Rackspace or whoever else. Aerospike typically works at 10% fewer nodes, right? And that's that's what we were talking about, I think, in Cassandra's context, that Google published this uh, benchmark. And uh, so essentially, what just using that Google reference, right? So 1 million transactions per second in Google compute environment, Cassandra needed 300 nodes, right? Aerospike needed 50 nodes for 1 million transactions per second for write. It needed 10 nodes for read, right? So you're dropping your cost from 300 instances of AWS, right? No matter what configuration you're using, right? So you get 6x lower price for your infra cost, for your write workload, right? For your read workload, it is whatever, 30x lower. Okay, now depending on what is your mix of read and write. Okay, so let's say you're saving 10x. Okay, that's that's one. I think if you look at the cost of ownership, even if you're getting the enterprise package, the licensing cost that you pay, okay, is going to be a very small portion. Okay, so I don't know what is the price point for various databases, but I don't think if you look at the total cost of ownership, it's going to be more than single digit of percentage. So if you're saving on the infrastructure cost, right i think that's where it's going to be a lot lot more significant all right so we saw aerospike in action we already did the partition maps right and this is the slide i was talking about that should we get into more of the details let's leave this for now uh, client APIs. So there was a question on how client connects to the cluster, right? So we talked about the multicast mesh protocol, right? So think of this as a mesh protocol or unicast protocol where your client application gets IP address of at least one node, right? And then through that IP address, it says, okay, by the way, this cluster has five different nodes, right? This is the partition map, okay? It gets that partition map from the cluster. It keeps on getting the newer partition map every second, right? So if your cluster state changes, your client is going to have inconsistent state of the partition map for no more than one second. If you have that inconsistent state, what happens is you are going to request a node which doesn't have this data or may not have this data. That time, it proxies that request to a different node, which is the right node, okay? Gets that data and sends it back, okay? So it's an additional hop, okay? Cluster state changes very rarely, right? Within cluster change, cluster state change, you have one second of window where this proxying would happen, okay? So if you look at the overall transactions, proxying should ideally never happen, okay? In practice, it will happen for very small, insignificant percent of the times, okay? If you are seeing more number of proxies, something is wrong. Some fine tuning is needed. Okay, so yes, I know where you are going. So when we started three nodes, right? And we started the test with first node. Right? Second and third node came up afterwards, okay? But the data was getting distributed everywhere. Then we killed first node, okay? Which was the seed node, okay? The test still continued because the cluster state is independent of what is the seed node is, right? The problem is if you bring down this first node, stop this test and restart it, okay? That time it's not going to connect because it has specified only one node which doesn't exist anymore. So we have conditions from customers who doesn't bring down their cluster for years, right? With the migration, the newer nodes getting up, right? The application was never shut down for years, right? The seed node, which was one, died long ago, right? And 
you have been upgrading it you have been moving to a newer uh, cluster newer more powerful machines and so on but the client application just kept running so your seed node doesn't exist anymore so before you have to restart your application you have to change the seed node address okay so what is safer is if you specify instead of one maybe two seed nodes okay that is safer okay but that is only going to require only if you are going to stop and start right does that answer your question okay yes absolutely coordinated node what what does that mean against the principle of democratic system share nothing architecture right so we, we don't have that okay we have the transaction request going from one node to other only in two cases one is the proxying right and second is when you are trying to write a replica copy okay so it gets to the primary copy of the partition right and then it goes to the replica and then it returns to the client application only when the replica has been written successfully right you can turn it off we talked about it right you can say i don't want a synchronous write i can live with a synchronous write okay if your business case can handle some sort of uh, inconsistent data state right you can choose it okay you would get potentially 30 percent higher throughput right otherwise nodes are independent they don't talk to each other except the hard bits yeah sure yes yeah so i think that's that's a good place to get into the right part okay so we already have that part okay let's let's finish it up uh, i think we have only a couple of slides how are we doing on time okay sure thanks thanks for coming how are we doing on time are we okay to continue All right. Okay. Uh, APIs are very simple. Uh, you can have put operation. This is essentially write, right? You can do a single key write. You can do a multiple key write. You can have a bin specified in the first call. You can specify another bin in the second call. That is treated as upgrade, update operation, right? You can specify a bin as null. That bin is del deleted. Now the record is deleted. Then you have get no no rocket science here you again read the entire record you can say okay i just want to read a fewer bins from the record you can read multiple keys in one operation the advantage you have by doing this is you don't make multiple round trips over the network yeah okay so then that is called as fire and forget right so that's a configuration setting right so by default it's synchronous replication if you turn it off right it's going to be you write it into master it will be scheduled to be written for the replica okay but it's not going to wait okay it may it may fail right so that's a trade-off you'll have to do all right so i think that's that's all i had so what are the whiteboard issues any other things that you want to talk about http so the apis that application c are the native api calls so when you're using java api right you get aerospike client you instantiate that object client dot connect right that's how you use it so it's not a curl kind of rest api okay it's it's a programming sdk api right any other question 
Yeah. Uh, we are not okay. So if you if you look at the querying ability, okay, it's limited, right? It does connect with popular analytical frameworks, okay? So for example, we have uh, uh, Lua-based user-defined functions, okay? You can do certain things on the server side. So you can do potentially a map reduce. Okay, so we already have that as part of the uh, general availability release GA. Uh, you can do those kind of things, right? It is not going to be coming out of package, right? You will write your custom map reduce functions, right? And then you can work on it, okay? Or you can do a streaming from this aerospec database to your spark or tableau or uh, hbs hadoop right you have that option okay but as a native built-in api set okay we don't do really the analytical things right it is most of the key value things right you set and get okay at a consistency level at a very high throughput okay that's that's what it is for right you get certain hooks right that you can use and do certain additional things right for example we have a beta feature uh, which is called as ldt okay uh, large data type so to answer your question right if you want to go beyond one million one megabyte size record size right how do you go uh, do that so ldt is a solution okay again it is not going to guarantee the throughput because you are distributing the record so we are not changing the block size right we are just making it go and write at multiple locations okay similar to what cassandra would do right it is going to be slower when you are trying to read it right but if your application has to have more than one megabyte you could do that sorry Miss, miss sauce. I don't know what miss sauce is. I I don't know, so I can't I can't say. Miss sauce. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. So is it is it a kind of clustering tool is it a load balancer that runs on top okay 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 got it got it mm -hmm. okay Mm -hmm. Okay. You can ask for the Uh-huh. Yeah. So the, I I think the clustering mechanism we have is kind of similar, right? So we are bringing multiple nodes and doing the horizontal scaling. I think that's what Mesos is doing. But this is this is kind of same process running on all the nodes. Mesos might be doing something more, saying that okay, three nodes should run my Apache, two nodes should run Hadoop, and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's it's defining the affinity at the uh, CPU level, right, or or the box level, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't I haven't heard. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
here. So I haven't heard uh, missiles in aerospike uh, context. So most likely we haven't tested on it, right? But I can get back to you whether we have actually tried it out. Yeah. So let's say that if I want increase in performance, if I want increase in performance, uh, your solution right now is to add more uh, nodes. Or is it, uh, will I get better performance by throwing in bigger compute power uh, nodes into the mix? And if I have to do that, as long as I have more CPU cores and more RAM, I can still democratically be part of the system. And I can decommission the uh, the old uh, performing uh, nodes. Okay. So, let me make sure I understood your system, right? Uh, I understood your question. So, we make most use of the hardware capabilities that are available on single box, right? That's where we are high performing system, right? Then that particular box, whatever is the capability may not be sufficient for you, okay? In terms of throughput, in terms of storage, in terms of replications, the high availability part. So you throw in additional boxes, right? The old model was, oh, you get a humongous box to run your Oracle, right? The new model is, you get a commodity hardware out of AWS, Google computer, whatever, right? Which will cost you a dollar or two per day, right? And then, can you upgrade that to a more powerful machine or can you add more machines of the same configuration, right? So, both the things work. So in fact, on AWS, on single instance, we have demonstrated 1 million transactions per second, right? Obviously, it would come with single copy of replication, right? So all the uh, shortcuts, right? So that we can achieve that 1 million transactions, right? But you can get that on single box, right? Now, if you can achieve that 1 million transactions per second, you know how much that translates into? 60 seconds is one minute, 60 minutes is one hour, 24 hours, right? So you multiply by that 3600 into 24, right? You're, you're doing more than what? How much would that be? 10 billion, 100 billion? If your system is handling 10 billion transactions per day, right? Then only you require additional capacity, right? very few systems in the world okay has that kind of load okay what you want is a insurance so that in future when i become big what is that i need scaling doesn't necessarily mean adding more if i add 10 nodes and tomorrow for example amazon no the question is why do you need 10 nodes let's say that i'm running a system with 10 nodes no, but why do you need 10 nodes? <laughs> if, if you just have money to throw, right? No. You can hand it over to me. It's a question of uh, the upgrade path, right? So, it's a question of upgrading, improving the throughput. If we have X number of nodes. Okay. Even for the case that you are faster, you, you know, you balance workload. Yeah. Even for that case, you would have benchmarks of other database for the same use case, right? Yeah. You know, 50% read, 50% write, so you mm -hmm. know. So, so, so I'm I'm trying to see. Well, when you say fastest, is it like 1.1 times faster? Okay, <laughs> I see. So, okay. You know, on the same benchmark. Yeah. So I would I would say uh, I think that's also answer to your question, right? So in memory, uh, we see Redis is the closest competitor, right? Uh, for the persistent store, there are Mongo, Cassandra, Couch, uh, a plethora of other players, right? So, in memory case, I think we are comparable to Redis in terms of throughput. But we are also doing clustering, adding consistent writes across multiple copies and so on. Okay. With Redis, you may not get the consistent replication. Okay. You can turn it off and then you could say, okay, I'm as good as Redis, sorry, if not better. For the persistent store, Maybe we are 5x, 10x faster, 
than most of the other competitors. Right? That's that's the scale we are talking about. Alright, so we have first node. So Okay, so let's look at how we are doing in terms of throughput. Okay, so this is this is usually very different. So right now this display is kind of shrinking that, so it looks very different. So I have to also struggle through. Oh, it has already started the third node as well. Okay, so nodes are configured to start with flagrant okay so i can i can bring it down and then we'll see but anyway let's look at it right so we didn't plan so it, it has already jumped right so we have all the three nodes in the cluster we don't do anything special except booting up the vagrant okay if it's not auto run okay all you do is service hero spike start that's all you did we configured the test for thirty thousand keys if you remember right this is kind of approximate equal distribution okay if you sum it up i think it's going to be 60k because it's the replication factor of two fine so far we are seeing a traffic of 4200 writes uh, sorry reads and 4300 writes okay the number of keys are going to be the same because we said 30,000 keys have to be created, 30,000 records have to be created and just keep on updating them, okay? You can set it for 100,000, 1 million, whatever the size. I'm not really stretching this tiny laptop with three virtual machines. So far, you're with me? All right. Now, let's see what happens if I bring down one of the nodes. Not this one. So, which one should I bring down? Second, first, third? Let's bring down the first node because our test connected to the first node, right? So in case there is a doubt. So let me just say stop. Node went down. Migrations have started. Okay, we should see approximately 30k, 30k keys. And by the way, this is interesting, right? So you see the dip. Okay, this is this is an error, uh, so we should fix it. So the dip is where the node went down, where it had to do the rehashing of the partition map. So it had a brief moment where the throughput dropped. Now the throughput is lower than what it was. It was earlier 4.2k. Now it is what 3 3.7k, right? because the migrations are still treated as writes. Oops. Come on. I think the problem is with this URL. Which, which node did we lose? see AMC the management console is running on only one node okay and that is the node we have brought down okay so it's only AMC which cannot connect okay the cluster is still running we can re-verify that by bringing it up and we'll pull down some other node You can, you can have AMC running on all the nodes, right? On my Vagrant image, I have installed AMC only on one virtual image. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can run it on all the VMs, okay? 
Do you want to do that? Because anyway, it's reporting your cluster-wide status. Replica is not on the same machine because this is a virtual image. Okay, so it's treated as different Linux box. Okay, so you would never have master and replica on the same box. Otherwise, why why should you have replica? Okay, so master of the partition, uh, whatever. So let's say partition ID uh, three. I'm master, and this node has died, right? I have a replica for part this partition ID that take over. Okay, and so your migration will fix it anyways, right? But if I don't respond, I know the replica exists on the other node, okay? And I will read from there. No, no, no. So as you see, we, we brought down nodes, we brought it up, right? So what happened, the reads and writes were never interrupted, right? Now you can also do this in the command line mode. Uh, so let's say I do, not the right way of doing it it's connecting to 127 so I have to specify the VM address come on I think my Machine is kind of slow right now. Should be okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's gonna be slow. Okay, so why don't I stop this? test right so that I can free up certain system resources you would see the reads and writes rate dropping now yeah there you go and let's bring down the other node so we chose the first node last time right let's choose the second node Second node is I think 152, right? So these are migrations for the partitions, right? Whichever partitions existed on this, which were occupied, those are partitions going on. So that was the proof of the pudding. Okay, so again, it's reporting that error. I think I, I'm going to report it back because this URL is still including all the three IP addresses for the nodes. Okay, so it's reporting that it can't connect to a particular thing. I'm sure it's still updating. All right, so let's move back to the PowerPoint. Why don't I stop everything so that the machine will be a little faster. Yeah. 
چرا؟ Yeah. Okay. So I think it's a uh, loaded question, right? Price is con uh, consisting of multiple parameters, right? One is what is the software price, right? You could be using community edition, so that is zero, right? Second is what is my infrastructure cost, right? So if I have to run a terabyte of data uh, with 50,000, 100,000 transactions per second. Think about how many nodes do you need, right? And that is your cost you are paying to AWS or Rackspace or whoever else. Aerospike typically works at 10% fewer nodes, right? And that's that's what we are talking about, I think, in Cassandra's context, that Google published this uh, benchmark. And uh, so essentially, what just using that Google reference, right? So 1 million transactions per second in Google compute environment, Cassandra needed 300 nodes, right? Aerospike needed 50 nodes for 1 million transactions per second for write. It needed 10 nodes for read, right? So you're dropping your cost from 300 instances of AWS, right? No matter what configuration you're using, right? So you get 6x lower price for your infra cost, for your write workload, right? For your read workload, it is order 30x lower, okay? Now, depending on what is your mix of read and write, okay? So let's say you're saving 10x, okay? That's, that's one. I think if you look at the cost of ownership, even if you're getting the enterprise package, the licensing cost that you pay, okay is going to be a very small portion okay so i don't know what is the price point for various databases but i don't think if you look at the total cost of ownership it's going to be more than single digit of percentage so if you're saving on the infrastructure cost right i think that's where it's going to be a lot lot more significant all right so we saw aerospec in action we already did partition maps right and this is the slide I was talking about that should we get into more of the details let's leave this for now uh, client APIs so there was a question on how client connects to the cluster right so we talked about the multicast mesh protocol right so think of this as a mesh protocol or unicast protocol where your client application gets IP address of at least one node right and then through that IP address it says okay by the way this cluster has five different nodes right this is the partition map okay it gets that partition map from the cluster it keeps on getting the newer partition map every second right so if your cluster state changes your client is going to have inconsistent state of the partition map for no more than one second. If you have that inconsistent state, what happens is you are going to request a node which doesn't have this data or may not have this data. That time it proxies that request to a different node which is the right node, okay, gets that data and sends it back. Okay, so it's an additional hop. Okay, cluster state changes very rarely right within clusters change cluster state change you have one second of window where this proxying would happen okay so if you look at the overall transactions proxying should ideally never happen okay in practice it will happen for very small insignificant percent of the times okay if you are seeing more number of proxies something is wrong some fine tuning is needed okay so yes i know where you're going so when we started three nodes right and we started the test with first node right second and third node came up afterwards okay but the data was getting distributed everywhere then we killed first node okay which was the seed node okay the test still continued because the cluster state 
is independent of what is the seed node is right the problem is if you bring down this first node stop this test and restart it okay that time it's not going to connect because it has specified only one node which doesn't exist anymore so we have conditions from customers who doesn't bring down their cluster for years right with the migration the newer nodes getting up right the application was never shut down for years right the seed node which was one died long ago right and you have been upgrading it you have been moving to a newer uh, cluster newer more powerful machines and so on but the client application just kept running so your seed node doesn't exist anymore so before you have to restart your application you have to change the seed node address okay so what is safer is if you specify instead of one maybe two seed nodes okay that is safer okay but that is only going to require only if you are going to stop and start right does that answer your question okay yes absolutely coordinated node what what does that mean against the principle of democratic systems here nothing architecture right so we we don't have that okay we have the transaction request going from one node to other only in two cases one is the proxying right and second is when you are trying to write a replica copy okay so it gets to the primary copy of the partition right and then it goes to the replica and then it returns to the client application only when the replica has been written successfully right you can turn it off we talked about it right you can say i don't want a synchronous write i can live with a synchronous write okay if your business case can handle some sort of uh, inconsistent data state right you can choose it okay you would get potentially 30% higher throughput right otherwise nodes are independent they don't talk to each other except the hard bits yeah sure yes yeah so i think that's that's a good place to get into the right part okay so we already have that part okay let's let's finish it up uh, i think we have only couple of slides how are we doing on time okay sure thanks thanks for coming how are we doing on time are we okay to continue all right okay uh, apis are very simple uh, you can have put operation this is essentially write right you can do a single key write you can do a multiple key write you can have a bin specified in the first call you can specify another bin in the second call that is treated as upgrade, update operation right you can specify a bin as null that bin is del deleted now the record is deleted then you have get no no rocket science here you again read the entire record you can say okay i just want to read a fewer bins from the record you can read multiple keys in one operation the advantage you have by doing this is you don't make multiple round trips over the network yeah okay so there, that is called as fire and forget right so that's a configuration setting right so by default it's synchronous replication if you turn it off right it's going to be you write it into master it will be scheduled to be written for the replica okay but it's not going to wait okay it may it may fail right so that's a trade off you have to do all right so i think that's that's all i had so what are the whiteboard issues 
any other things that you want to talk about HTTP. So the APIs that applications see are the native API calls. So when you are using Java API, right, you get Aerospike client, you instantiate that object, client dot connect, right, that's how you use it. So it's not a curl kind of REST API, okay, it's, it's a programming SDK API, right. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, we are not okay so if you if you look at the querying ability okay it's limited right it does connect with popular analytical frameworks okay so for example we have uh, uh, Lua based user defined functions okay you can do certain things on the server side so you can do potentially a map reduce okay so we already have that as part of the uh, general availability release GA uh, you can do those kind of things right it is not going to be coming out of package right you will write your custom map reduce functions right and then you can work on it okay or you can do a streaming from this aerospace database to your spark or tableau or uh, hbase hadoop right you have that option okay but as a native built-in api set okay we don't do really the analytical things right it is most of the key value things right you set and get okay at a consistency level at a very high throughput okay that's that's what it is for right you get certain hooks right that you can use and do certain additional things right for example we have a beta feature uh, which is called as ldt okay uh, large data type so to answer your question right if you want to go beyond 1 million 1 megabyte size record size right how do you go uh, do that so ldt is a solution okay again it is not going to guarantee the throughput because you are distributing the record so we are not changing the block size right we are just making it go and write at multiple locations okay similar to what cassandra would do right it is going to be slower when you are trying to read it right but if your application has to have more than one megabyte you could do that sorry miss miss sauce i don't know what miss sauce is I, I don't know so I can't I can't say miss sauce okay uh -huh. Uh -huh. okay so is it is it a kind of clustering tool is it a load balancer that runs on top okay 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 got it got it mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. I, I think the clustering mechanism we have is kind of similar right so we are bringing multiple nodes and doing the horizontal scaling I think that's what Mesos is doing but this is this is kind of same process running on all the nodes Mesos might be doing something more saying that okay three nodes should run my Apache two nodes should run Hadoop and so on 
Right. Correct. So it's it's defining the affinity at the uh, CPU level, right, or or the box level, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't I haven't heard. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I haven't heard uh, missiles in aerospike uh, context, so most likely we haven't tested on it, right? But I can get back to you whether we have actually tried it out. Yeah. If I want increase in performance, uh, your solution right now is to add more uh, nodes. Or is it, uh, will I get better performance by throwing in bigger compute power uh, nodes into the mix? And if I have to do that, as long as I have more CPU cores and more RAM, I can still democratically be part of the system. And I can decommission the, uh, the old uh, performing uh, nodes. Okay. So, let me make sure I understood your system, right? Uh, I understood your question. So, we make most use of the hardware capabilities that are available on single box, right? That's where we are high performing system, right? Then that particular box, whatever is the capability may not be sufficient for you, okay? In terms of throughput, in terms of storage, in terms of replications, the high availability part. So you throw in additional boxes, right? The old model was, oh, you get a humongous box to run your Oracle, right? The new model is, you get a commodity hardware out of AWS, Google computer, whatever, right? Which will cost you a dollar or two per day, right? And then, can you upgrade that to a more powerful machine or can you add more machines of the same configuration, yes, so right? So, both the things work. So, in fact, on AWS, on single instance, we have demonstrated 1 million transactions per second, right? Obviously, it would come with single copy of replication, right? So, all the uh, shortcuts, right? So, that we can achieve that 1 million transactions, right? But you can get that on single box, right? Now, if you can achieve that 1 million transactions per second, you know how much that translates into? 60 seconds is one minute, 60 minutes is one hour, 24 hours, right? So you multiply by that 3600 into 24, right? You're, you're doing more than what? How much would that be? 10 billion, 100 billion? If your system is handling 10 billion transactions per day, right? Then only you require additional capacity, right? very few systems in the world okay has that kind of load okay what you want is a insurance so that in future when i become big what is that i need scaling doesn't necessarily mean adding more if i add 10 nodes and tomorrow for example amazon no the question is why do you need 10 nodes let's say that i'm running a system with 10 nodes no, but why do you need 10 nodes? <laughs> if, if you just have th money to throw, right? No. You can hand it over to me. It's a question of uh, the upgrade path, right? So, it's a question of upgrading, improving the throughput. If we have X number of nodes. Okay. okay. So, now we are talking about throughput in terms of transactions per second? Yes. Okay. We already talked about single node can handle easily forget about the 1 million TPS, right? That is kind of fine-tuned for certain data types and so on. Typically, we see in production 100k TPS, right? On a node, right? Uh, this would be the large instances, R3 kind of instances on AWS, okay? Or, 
yeah so that's what i said typically right uh, so every every customer will have different kinds of uh, throughput so this is something i'm talking about let's say ad tech kind of use tech, use case right or a cookie store or a session store right where your record size is going to be a kilobyte or two kilobytes right because real time right if you want half a millisecond response time you also want to run million request in a second right and you are running it on one gigabit network right so how how, how is it going to calculate right yeah more than one mb one mb is the maximum limit you can have yeah no, I think I think your data model is wrong in this case. I'll I'll tell you what how how it works, right? You can have large records, right? You can save image, right? Why do you need image in aerospace database for real-time processing? Your browser provides you a late loading and lazy loading all kind of features, right? Shove it onto Dropbox or S3 or whatever, right? You don't you don't want that image to be loaded in five milliseconds. Your Facebook image doesn't load while you are scrolling. No, no, no. So let's let's step back, right? You have to make a conscious choice, okay? Whether your system is high performance system, okay, or a more data full system, right? You have choice. Let's say Facebook, right? You can say my entire data about this user, whatever this has a user has chatted whatever is on his timeline, whatever are the images, whatever are the likes and comments, right? Everything is in single record. That's one data model. You can divide that into, oh, here is a data model for friends list, here is a data model for blah, here is a data model for blah, right? You can also divide it saying that, oh, by the way, what is not real time? Okay, I will use a MySQL for that. Think about use case. What is not real time on Facebook? How much time it takes to load your friends list? That is not real time use case. Right? So you don't need that there. Okay? Who you might want to connect? That's not a real time use case. That's analytical use case. You could have a graph database or whatever else. Right? You, you do that calculation. Okay? You are not going to get a solution which says, oh, I have Apache and Apache is going to give me 100,000 concurrent connections. No, you fine tune it, right? So you do the right data modeling and then you get the maximum throughput, right? So let's say you are tracking 5 billion cookies, right? And you want to shove in all the websites that user has been visiting because it's a tracking cookie. Right? So your cookie size is going to be 100 kilobytes and you have 5 billion cookies to track. Why are you doing it? So what you do is you differentiate the real time data and non real time data. Right? Whatever has lost its relevance, you shove that into a larger data store, right? more persistent data store, do the pre-processing of the analytical data that you need keep that in the real time system okay that 100 kb will reduce to 10 kilobytes when you have pre-processed that or even smaller that is what you need to be real time answered first you are going to pay cost of 100 k over the network then you're going to process that data right why do you have to do that do that in background yeah go ahead Yeah. Um, we have a use case. Uh, so it's like uh, when in our product we create a new contract. Yeah. Uh, it takes a lot of time in creating contract. 
so uh, one of the places where you know customers when they call uh, in europe they have different uh, states and cities and then there are addresses right mm-hmm. so customer doesn't know the exact address yeah. but the the guy who is creating a contract you know based on what customer says mm-hmm. like they want to quickly find out the address of that particular person okay right so it's kind of like when you type you actually how, want how fast how fast these agents can type is it a 1 millisecond requirement it's not real time requirement for me mm. how fast can you type yeah okay <laughs> no i i was uh, just trying to understand that so whether we you can, can you can use this right but i don't think you are really looking for a lightning blazing fast speed here okay right you're looking for acceptable speed okay that's different yeah, but like if we have huge amount of data of these streets and addresses uh uh-huh. if i go and store it somewhere in database yeah right my sql or something and then when they are actually typing mm-hmm. instantly i want to give them the suggestions yeah that use, okay use elastic search that works perfectly fine for you right okay see we we cannot afford to build complex secondary indexes for example we support secondary index but that comes with a cost every time you update a record your secondary index tree has to update it right so you are consuming more resources of your node hmm. we don't have secondary index where where city like pune okay we don't have that you only have city equals to pune you can have that query but you can't say okay city name starting with pu hmm. we don't do that it's always exact okay. match okay because if you look at number of combinations that we have to maintain okay right because then it gets into more of your memory intensive compute in- intensive process for every transaction if you support that your throughput goes down right if you are going to look for the specific key okay this works perfectly fine specific bin this works perfectly fine okay, then the other use case uh, is uh like we have a huge amount of master data in our application right master master data okay. kind of stuff so we want a quick look up for that uh-huh. in our pages yeah so we were thinking of this redis cache uh, stuff okay so in yeah. that so, case uh, if if your data is not bigger than what it can fit into memory right then you can look for something that is in memory okay so I'll, i'll give you example what is the largest ram you can buy or the hardware can support okay i think amazon supports 256 gig or something right if your data is going to be bigger than that right obviously you need replication because you don't want to lose data right think about you are paying for 256 gig of ram versus you are paying for 16 gig of ram and shoving that data into ssd okay your machine cost is going to be at least 50 times cheaper right what is the compromise you are doing with in memory database you are going to get let's say less than 1 millisecond response for 99.9% of the transactions right with ssd you might get 2 milliseconds for 99.99% okay for 1 millisecond of response time if that is so critical we talked about the online fraud kind of cases okay they cannot compromise on certain things if your can more and 1 millisecond versus 2 millisecond doesn't matter to you right choice is yours so whoever has extra money i'm ready to take it if 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 your if your data size is not more than 1 megabyte okay which will rule out most of the videos right and it will also rule out most of the images as well right again think about we are not a general purpose database okay we are only for the real time use case you can use it for other cases right but then this is not the sweet spot for error spike okay i'm not saying that it won't work okay but why are you using aerospike you're not getting the advantages it provides 
Yeah, absolutely. People like Snapdeal and so on are already using it. Right. Yeah. I mean, so if it works at Snapdeal's case, right, right. it should work on most so of the other cases. Because at well. a record level, it is as it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one more question. So, I mean, long back, uh, uh, I worked on Terracotta. Mm -hmm. So, VM yeah. level. So, can you say that uh, it is equivalent to AES cache using a Terracotta uh -huh. and clustering it? Uh -huh. It is the same way that, but it is much of kind of a database way. I can I can possibly say confidently what Aerospike is. I may not be confidently able to say the analogy that you are trying to say, uh, right? Because I don't I don't know if I understand that well enough. The analogy is that it just, it's a simple caching. I mean, so mm -hmm. you know, it's a VM level caching. Yeah. But uh, when you do a VM level caching on one node, then you expect the other node to be you know speed up. Let's say if you updated something, then uh, other node should be get also updated. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and you expect all nodes in sync. The you know, let's say I used a hash map. Let's say, so if I update a key and value, uh -huh. the other nodes will also get replicated with the same way. Yeah, so, so we we already have that. We have complex data structures supported. Uh, so we have list and map. Okay, so and if you update one, right, the other replicas are getting updated. Can I get so all the keys also here? Can I get all the keys? All the keys in terms of in a one table or uh -huh. one map? Yeah, you can do a scan. Yeah. Oh, we can okay, scan? Absolutely. You can do query, you can do scan, okay. right? What I was saying is querying is not that complex, right? So you can't say order by, group by, multiple where clauses, right? But you can say, okay, give me all the keys where city is Pune, as, as we said, right? You will get all the keys. You can scan the entire uh, uh, database where you say set equals to blah or namespace equal to blah, right? You will get everything, right? If it's needed, yeah, you can do it. So, uh, time check. <laughs> we are already at six, we are past our time. So, if we can just have a few questions and then, you know, we don't want to hold back Samir and also we want to make sure that we stick to some time, okay? Yeah, so uh, all the names that I mentioned, uh, so which one, foren Forensic IQ is what I mentioned, right? So if you, if you go to, I think, customers or some related page, I don't know what exactly the page is, but we have a bunch of use cases listed, okay? Not everything is allowed to be displayed in the public domain, but whoever has allowed us, in fact, what we do is, uh, somebody asked, right, how fast are we and so on, right, or why we are better than other database. So we ask our customers to write blogs, right, so that when uh, a Snapdeal tells you why they are using Aerospike instead of any other competing products, right, it's a lot more authentic and trustworthy information, right. And whenever that is kind of given in the public domain from the customer side, we also list that as a use case on our website. So you would find a bunch of use cases there. I don't understand technology anyways. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good question. So, Aerospike started, yeah, approximately five years ago, right? We, we were called Citrus Leaf then. Okay. Citrus Leaf and today's Aerospike, right? The company name has changed. Uh, has been only working on one product since its inception, right? The product has been evolving uh, with, I think, 3.x release, we renamed the product from Citrus Leaf to Aerospike, right? And uh, like, as a Aerospike release has been around for, I think, year and a half now, maybe two years, but we do nothing but real-time, fast, transactional database, okay? It's more of a coincidence that it's also no NoSQL, okay? So, we don't call ourselves as NoSQL database. We, we just say, okay, we are a real-time database. Yeah. Yeah. How do you decide 
when to scale up and when to scale up. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. But, uh, is there any kind of uh, tool that you provide to me? Yeah. So, okay. see, uh, yeah. how do they decide whether uh, in this context I should use up? Yeah. So I think it, it goes back to yeah. Mukun's question. Sorry, I was kind of little snappy at you, but uh, see, there are going to be certain limitations imposed by your hardware, right? So you could be limited in terms of throughput, right? Which most likely could be because you are maxing out, saturating on the network side, you are saturating on the memory side, you are saturating on the CPU side, right? Now, that is where you are kind of taking the full juice out of one system, right? But let's say you are maxing out on memory, but you still have network and uh, CPU left, right? Potentially, you can upgrade to a higher uh, memory instance, right? And you can get advantage of with lower cost, right? Because you have some spare capacity on the other fronts. So you can fine tune that, okay? So what we have is we have a capacity planner guide, okay? We are we are not really a very well organized company in terms of putting every tool out in the public domain, right? So it, it still exists in public domain, but it's not in a great user friendly manner. But whenever a customer gets onto Aerospike, that is the first thing we do, okay? How much memory you will require in terms of primary index? Are you going to use secondary index? How you should do capacity planning? What kind of throughput do you need? What kind of hosting environment you have? Which kind of configurations you should use so that you get maximum juice out of a Google compute, Amazon, Rackspace and so on, right? Once you do that, what is your replication factor should be, right? Do you want to do it in memory? Do you want to do SSD? We talked about this large data, right? Are you going to have multiple data centers, right? What should be the network topology? So we walk you through, product is pretty complex, right? And public domain information is there, okay? Most of the information is out there, okay? The only problem is we haven't organized it that well yet, okay? So it's work in progress, okay? So we are, we are so busy on the engineering side, right? So website documentation is slightly behind, okay? It's catching up, but not there yet. It could be better. All right. Are we good? We are. Uh, I think we, we still have few few questions on the whiteboard. Many of you have gotten started, and uh, honestly, some of these are academic, and you could learn it on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, whoever is interested, there are there are very good white papers available on Aerospike site. Okay. So there is a white paper I personally like very much is a white paper written by founders of the company Brian and Srini in 2011 uh, that was published in very large databases uh, forum so if you search on aerospike white paper VLDB right you would find that right and that talks about lots of these things okay in very very concise and clear manner Okay, I may not be doing the right job in explaining that to you, right? But if you read that paper, I think most of these questions would be answered to your satisfaction, right? You can reach out to me. My email address is Samir, S-A-M-I-R, at aerospec.com. We'll be happy to answer your questions offline as well. So we have to wrap up here. Thank you very much, Samir, and thank you everyone who came here. Uh, and especially thank you to you, uh, Mukun, for organizing this. So. Thank you, TechNext and Synerzip. If you have any questions, like Samir said, please email to him. Uh, hopefully, everybody has signed up here so that I can email as well. So I'll get back to you. Anybody else? You haven't signed up? OK. Uh, you will be getting an email from me shortly. I'm Ritu. So don't consider as a spam when you get an email from me. If not, if your handwriting I cannot understand, then please come here and take a business card and let's keep in touch. Go through Facebook, go through our meetup.com scale warrior uh, and check out our Twitter page. I'm from the marketing side. So that guy who has asked a non-technical question gets a t-shirt like me. What's your name? <laughs> Deepak, from which company? Yeah. Awesome. So you get a t-shirt.
Sorry, I'm being a little miser, but uh, if you give good feedback on our social media page, you guys will get a t-shirt as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.